There we go. All right. <clears throat> I used to know a guy who, who liked to say in moments of indecision, we need to do something even if it's wrong. And, and he was trying to be funny at those times, but he's got kind of a point in, in a way. Inactivity and indecision are the biggest obs obstacles of change and the greatest enemies of success that there are. There's a word that applies to what I'm talking about. And you all know the word. It's big and it's ugly and it's more powerful than we care to admit. And that word is procrastination. And that's something that, that we've all done at one time or another. And I would venture to say that most of us have been guilty of it in the past week. Maybe even in the last 24 hours. Procrastination is simply putting off till later those things which could be or should be done now. There are a lot of reasons why people procrastinate. They nearly all come down to this. We procrastinate to postpone what we perceive as pain. We procrastinate a specific job to put off the pain of work. We procrastinate going on a diet to put off the pain of going hungry. We procrastinate dealing with a relationship problem in order to put off the pain of confrontation. Sometimes we procrastinate trying to succeed to put off the pain of potential failure. The problem with procrastination is that it never makes your life better. It generally always makes it worse. Projects never become easier when you put them off. They always become more difficult. But every one of us struggles with procrastination. And if you'll declare war on this bad habit, and really, it, 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 it's not just a bad habit, let's be honest, it's a sin. But if you will declare war on this sin, I can make you some promises. Promise number one, you can overcome procrastination. Now first, if you're serious about overcoming procrastination and you seek God's help in the process, you will win the battle and he will give you victory. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. In other words, everyone faces temptation. Going on, God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. In other words, the pull of procrastination is certainly as big and ugly and powerful as we think it is. However, it's not bigger than the grace of God that's at work in all of us. Again, continuing on in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Now that's great news. Now, Paul wasn't speaking specifically about procrastination when he wrote that and when he wrote Romans uh, 7. But his words can certainly apply. Romans 7 verses 15, 18, and 19 says, I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. Does that sound like you? Sounds like me a lot of times. It, 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 and, and, and then he goes on to say in verses 24 and 25, Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then a few verses later, 
Paul says in Romans 8, 37, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. So yes, we can overcome procrastination. Promise number two, overcoming procrastination leads to peace. You can have victory over procrastination, and with victory comes peace of mind. Do you know what's crazy about the human species? M many of the things that we worry about are things that we can do something about, if only we would. But instead, we cut, get caught in this cycle of inactivity. Inactivity leads to worry, and then worry leads to inactivity, and it becomes this never-ending loop. If you can break that cycle, and by God's power you most certainly can, you can experience the peace of mind that comes from being on top of things. Solomon said in Proverbs 10:4, idle hands make one poor, but diligent hands bring riches. Now, Yes, he did say idle or lazy. And since I'm a charter member of the Procrastinators Club, I, 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 I have to agree that procrastination and laziness are very closely linked. It's, that's not necessarily an easy thing for me to admit. But there are times when I procrastinate that it's because I'm just being lazy. I mean, that's, that's the bitter truth. Solomon says that when you're lazy, you end up poor. However, when you work hard, you have financial stability. Now, please understand that when he talks about poverty and wealth, he's not just talking about your bank account here. He's talking about the quality of your life. I've known quite a few people who, who made a pretty good living, but their lives were erratic and stressful because their schedule was always defined by getting things done at the last possible moment. I've also known people who always seem to be on the precipice of success, but their procrastination, or as Solomon would call it, their laziness, kept them from achieving the, su the success that they were capable of achieving. And it kept them from experiencing peace of mind. And it kept them from enjoying the satisfaction of a job well done. When you beat procrastination, you can kiss that kind of stress goodbye. One of the things that I've learned about procrastination is procrastinators rarely enjoy a day off. Procrastinators always feel like they should be doing something. That's because procrastinators are always behind schedule. Now, whether you procrastinate because you're behind or whether you're behind because you procrastinate is beside the point because they're both true, more than likely. But when you overcome procrastination, you'll begin to experience the peace of mind that comes from being on top of things. Promise number three. Overcoming procrastination puts you in charge of your life. Another thing that I can promise you is that you'll begin to experience a sense of control. You'll, you'll experience a feeling of actually being in charge of your life. Most of us know what it's like to be driven by circumstances. To, 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 have, to have your schedule controlled by by all those things that didn't get done. From the minute you wake up, you're scrambling to complete 
a past due assignment, scrambling to make the deposit before the check bounces, or to pay the bill before the electricity gets shut off, or scrambling to find clothes that fit because you keep putting off getting into shape. It's a horrible state to be in. And, and, and we need to know that it's a state in which none of us needs to live. I want you to know that it's possible for you to wake up every day feeling like you're in charge of your life. In fact, the Bible tells us that that's how it should be. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8, Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. Without leader, administrator, or ruler, it prepares its, pro its provisions in summer. It gathers its food during harvest. Solomon's saying that the ant is in charge of his life because he takes the action necessary in order to get things done. And when you overcome procrastination, you can experience that same sense of control. Now, a few minutes ago, I stated that a general cause of procrastination um, I said that we procrastinate in order to postpone what we perceive as, as a pain. And I think it'll help you to overcome procrastination if we explore this reason just a little bit further. If we identify the cause of procrastination. A former supervisor of mine, when I was with the park board, said a problem well defined is half solved. Now, if that's true, then it should benefit us greatly if we can give some extra thought to the specific reasons why we procrastinate. And if you can identify what's influencing your habit of inactivity, then you can combat it. There are a few common causes. Unfortunately, one common cause is laziness. And once again, let me just say, this one's hard for me to confess. I'd rather admit to just about anything in the world than to tell you all there are times that I'm very lazy. Okay? But it's the truth. Sometimes I procrastinate simply because I don't feel like working on something. Yeah, Sam's back there going, me too. <laughs> okay? Another cause of procrastination is lack of knowledge or skill. In the first church that I ever served in while I was in college, I was asked to oversee a summer remodeling project on the back of the church. I had no idea at all what I was doing. This is the extent of my carpentry skills. I know how to use the claw of the hammer to pull out the nail that I just hit in that's crooked. <laughs> that's me, okay? And, and, and it was my job to make sure that this back porch and patio section on the church was, was repaired properly. But I kept putting it off and kept putting it off and kept putting it off because I had no idea what I was doing until the pastor finally started getting a little angry with me. But I was procrastinating because I had no idea what I was supposed to do and how to organize it. Now that's no excuse because it was my job to learn how to do that. But I just kept procrastinating. I didn't even try. <laughs> Another cause of procrastination is perfectionism. We say, I want to do this job perfectly, but I'm not feeling real perfect today. So I'll wait till tomorrow. Maybe I'll feel better then. But that never works. Another cause of procrastination is the fear of frustration. We know that the job is difficult. We know that we're easily overwhelmed, and so we keep putting it off. 
Now understand, all of these can be individual or just a combination of many of them together. Okay? But yet another cause of procrastination is rebellion. Parents see this in teenagers quite a lot. They'll wait until the very last minute to take out the trash or to get ready for school in an effort to prove that they can't be pushed around. Spouses seem the same thing in one another at times. Employers see it in, in employees. It's an attitude that says, I'll do what I have to do, but I'm going to irritate you as much as possible in the process. When you procrastinate, it's good to be able to identify which attitude is causing the problem. I'm no stranger to all five of these causes of procrastination. I don't favor one over the other. I'm an equal opportunity procrastinator. Okay? However, it's good to know why you're putting off important projects because it can help you to get to the root of the problem. And then the last thing that I want to talk about real quickly is to give you five tips for dealing with procrastination. James said in James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of of the word that's focal there that's what we should all aspire to be the opposite of procrastination is taking action it's doing what we should be doing so when you take care of your body you're a doer of the word when you give yourself wholeheartedly to your job you are a doer of the word. When you take care of your finances and take care of your house and meet your responsibilities, you're a doer of the word. A person who merely listens to the word, that's a procrastinator. That kind of person knows the right thing to do. They know the truth. They know how to solve a problem. They know what needs to be done, but they kid themselves into believing that they don't need to take action right now. James says don't be that kind of person. Instead, be a doer of the word. So here are five tips, if you will. That will, that will help you to get off of your blessed assurance and on your feet doing what needs to be done. Number one, remember that feelings follow actions. Always. Now I know that there are times that we put off doing something until we feel better. But the fact is that doing something is the key to feeling better. Here's the principle. It's easier to act your way to better feelings than it is to feel your way to better actions. Don't get the cart before the horse. Don't say, when I feel good, then I will do good. It never works. Instead, you need to say, I'm going to do good now so that I can feel good soon. Inactivity will never make your life better. And it will never make you feel better. But taking action can do both. I remember when I was in grade school, I was sick a lot for one reason or another. Um, they traced it down to uh, ultimately that it was my tonsils. I kept getting infections in my tonsils and that would just throw me off. It just made me sick um, and, until they finally took them out. Um, and, and, and I always 
you know, when I was, you know, would stay home by myself and uh, mom owned her own business and had to run the business and, and so she would go to work while we stayed home and then she'd just call in, you know, every hour or so and see how we were. And, and, and on those days when I stayed home, if all I did was lay in bed, I never really felt any better by the end of the day. But if I would get up and actually do stuff, I would always feel better by the end of the day because I was up. I, mean, I, was, I mean, there was actually activity going on. Number two, reevaluate every procrastination provoking event. In the book of 1 Samuel, there's a story about a giant named Goliath. He challenged the Israelite army in battle. Every day, he would stand in the battlefield within shouting distance of the, of the army, of the Israelite army, and he would say, This day, I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And the Israelite army responded by doing nothing. They were, the Bible says, dismayed and terrified. They didn't believe that they could defeat Goliath in battle. So they cowered in fear and kept putting off the inevitable. And then this teenage shepherd boy came along, saw what was happening, except he saw it with the right perspective. He didn't see an enemy that was too big to defeat. He saw a target that was too big to miss. And he also evaluated the situation in terms of God's power and God's presence in his life. He said, you know, when I'm watching my sheep and a lion or a bear comes along, I go after that wild animal and I kill it. This so-called giant is no different. He had no right to defy the army of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. And you all know what happened next. David took his slingshot and a couple of rocks and he walked onto the battlefield and he put Goliath out of his misery. The army was procrastinating, so to speak, because they saw a problem as being bigger than themselves and even bigger than God. David evaluated the situation correctly. He said, this is no different than what I've seen God do in the past. And I know he's going to do it again. There are times that we procrastinate because a project looks bigger than life. And if we make an effort to evaluate the situation in light of God's truth, we're going to see it for what it is. And we'll have the wherewithal to face it. We'll learn to say, you know, this is just a monthly report. Or, or it's just a 20-minute walk. I can do that. Or it's just one chapter in the Bible. I can read that. And on and on. Reevaluate, reshape, and resize whatever it is that's tempting you to procrastinate. Thirdly, divided by five. When I come across something that I think is too big, I have a tendency to divide those projects into five sections, what I call five easy pieces. When I'm simply not motivated to do anything, I allow myself to just do one section at a time. At least then, 
I'm making a little bit of progress. Any project that I've got going, I can usually tell you where I stand. I'm either 20% of the way there, or 60% of the way there, or 80% of the way there, because I divide everything into five pieces. Now, understand that these are not always five equal pieces, okay? Because some sections take longer than others. But it helps me to be able to stay motivated if I, do, if I break that project up in my head in pieces. And, and in, instead of attacking the whole thing at once, I think, okay, I can, I can do this section. I can do this and get it done. And that way I'm making progress on the whole. It, 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 it may take several days to get there, but I can still do it. Fourthly, tough it out for 10 minutes. <clears throat> I heard about this trick from a former pastor. Okay. He said that when he's tempted to procrastinate a certain project, whether it was preparing a sermon, preparing for a meeting, devoting time to his family, he, he makes a 10-minute commitment. He says, I'll do this for 10 minutes and see how it goes. And if, and if I don't have the wherewithal in me to continue, then I'll stop. But he said most of the time, after 10 minutes, he, was, he, he, he had developed enough inertia, if you will, and, and had established a rhythm, and, and, and he discovered that, that continuing was a whole lot easier than he ever thought it would be. When he had a half a dozen visits to make, he would commit to making at least one. Do one. And then if he still felt too drained to go on, he'd take a break. But at least he had that one done. This 10 minute commitment works because of the first principle, feelings follow actions. Now it may only be sheer determination that gets you started, but if you'll take those first couple of steps, invest those first few minutes, even if you're just barely sticking your toe in the water, so to speak, you'll nearly always discover the inner resources necessary in order to continue. And when you don't, when you're just too overwhelmed, too panicked, too depressed, too frustrated, or too fearful to continue, give yourself permission to, to back off for a little bit. Try to seek God's strength a little bit more. Reevaluate the situation a little bit more. And then prepare yourself to attack it again. And then here's the fifth tip for overcoming procrastination. Consider who you're serving. Paul said in Colossians 3, 23, the first part of that, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. There's a sense in which every job that we do, we do as an offering to God. We say, God, I'm going to do this report, this presentation, this lesson plan, this, this eight-hour shift, whatever it is, I'm going to do this for you, Lord. It's not going to come close to the perfection that you deserve. It may not even be the best that I'm capable of doing, but today, that's the best that I can do. Today, I'm going to give it my all. And I'm going to give that all to you. It's not a bad attitude to have. It also helps to remember that you're not only serving God, you're also called to serve others. Galatians 5.13, the last half of that verse, says, Serve one another through love. 
You need to get to the point that you realize that everything you do benefits someone in some way. The exception there is sin. Sin doesn't benefit anyone. But every good thing that you do benefits somebody else. When you're tempted to put off that thing that you should be doing, try to remember who you're going to be hurting because of its absence. Remember who will benefit by your effort. Remember who you serve. This, this whole series of sermons, the one last week and, and the one today and at least one more, uh, the one next week, uh, the, 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 it's a series about change, okay? And, and, and it's about more than just turning over a new leaf. It's about living a new life, one that's different than the old life, and one that stays changed. The biggest obstacle of change is inactivity. Inactivity is just another word for procrastination. We all know what we should do, but sometimes we struggle with the will to do it. Today we've looked at the idea of becoming doers of the Word and how we make it a habit to take action when we'd rather really do nothing at all. Former procrastinators, here's what I want you to go home with. Action creates change. All it takes is that first step in the right direction to get started. Next week, we're going to take a look at taking responsibility for a change.